Red Bull sold around 11.6 billion cans in 2022, which is more than one can for each person on Earth. This shows how many people like it. In 2022, the brand made nearly $10 billion in revenue from this. So how does Red Bull sell so much? What drove this company to become this big? The answer is hidden in its beginning. And in this video, we're going to take a look into that. In 1982, Dietrich Mateschitz, an Austrian businessman, was jet-lagged from his flight to Bangkok. Even though he was tired, he met with Chileo Uvidaya, a local seller. Uvidaya saw that Mateschitz was struggling and gave him a special drink he had made. This drink was not like any other. It was Uvidaya's secret recipe. When Mateschitz drank it, he immediately felt better. Originally, it was a Thai energy drink that targeted laborers and truck drivers with a sweeter blend of taurine and caffeine. He made it cheap so people who worked hard could afford it. The drink, called Krading Dang, became famous in Thailand for giving energy. Krading Dang translates to Red Gaur, a large Southeast Asian bison. Mataschitz kept buying Uvidaya's drink in Thailand. Uvidaya was smart at making people like his drink. Even though Japanese and Korean drinks were popular and expensive in Asia, Uvidaya saw a chance to make a cheaper drink. Mataschitz's discovery of Krading Dang's efficacy and the success of a major Japanese energy drink company inspired his global ambitions for its popularity. So, he talked to Uvidaya about taking Krading Dang to Europe. The rest is history. Now, Europe loves Red Bull a lot. It's connected to big sports like Formula One and soccer all around the world. But it wasn't always like this. When Red Bull started, it stood out with a unique taste, small can, and higher price compared to Coca-Cola. Despite initial skepticism, Mateschitz and Uvidaya believed in its energy-boosting potential. They adapted the formula for Europe, keeping key ingredients like caffeine, sucrose, glucose, and taurine. The original name, Krading Dang, changed, leading to the creation of Red Bull, which remains unchanged. In some places, Red Bull has different amounts of caffeine. But what about taurine, one of the important ingredients? First, let's clear up something that taurine doesn't come from bull sperm. It's an amino acid found in humans and animals. Initially sourced from ox bile, Red Bull now acquires it differently. Taurine assists in various bodily functions and may benefit epilepsy. While not a primary energy drink component, its role is debated. Some areas banned Red Bull due to taurine, given the unclear impacts. Red Bull was briefly taken off German shell due to cocaine traces, yet its coca leaves only add flavor, not cocaine. Germany considers minuscule 0.13 micrograms harmless. France banned, then approved Red Bull in 2008, citing taurine safety. Taurine raises concerns in Europe and the US, despite acceptance in Asia. Allegations of harm and fatality surround Red Bull, often tied to taurine. Now, let's look at the other important thing, caffeine. Caffeine isn't really addictive, but it can make you want more. The good thing is that caffeine isn't as bad for you as some other addictive thing, but you can get used to having it. Using a regular Red Bull can as a reference, note that it contains as much or even more sugar than Coca-Cola, along with significant caffeine and disgust taurine. The Red Bull gives you wings tagline implies energy, but can lead to hospitalizations. In 2014, a $13 million lawsuit challenged this slogan, alleging false advertising as a long-term consumer found no athletic improvement despite it. Mataschitz had big dreams beyond just making people happy with Red Bull. When Red Bull launched in 1987, he wanted it to be seen as a special and fancy product. The design of the can, the way it looked, and its high price made it seem luxurious. Initially, in Thailand, Katring Dang was consumed for energy. Mataschitz aimed to target wealthy, thrill-seeking Europeans, partygoers, skiers, and affluent students, offering more than coffee. Mataschitz's strategies included employing students to host Red Bull parties, distributing the drink widely, and branding cars as Red Bull minicars. These efforts led to the sale of a million cans in Red Bull's first year, establishing its fame. Red Bull also performed another smart marketing stunt in London. Even though the brand was not renowned at that time, they started piling up all the trash cans and dumpsters with crushed Red Bull cans all the time. It gave Londoners the idea that this new drink was so popular and trendy that everybody was drinking it, and that's how it became popular in London as well. But Mataschitz didn't stop there. He didn't just want people to enjoy Red Bull. He wanted it to be a big part of the culture making people talk about and remember it. That's why Red Bull got into extreme sports. In 1989, they started with race car driver Gerard Berger. 
This was just the beginning of many sports collaborations. Red Bull diversified by sponsoring sports like BMX, skiing, and the Dakar Rally, emphasizing excitement. It transitioned from parties to sports associations. Red Bull expanded further, backing Formula One, football teams, and orchestrating space edge jumps. Matashit's innovation sustained growth. Formula One is a great example of this. Red Bull started by buying a struggling team, Jaguar Racing, for only a dollar. But Matashit's promised to spend $400 million on it. The team was worth $640 million by 2018 and had won the championship five times by 2021. This shows Matashit's big plan. Even though Red Bull started with drinks, now they have started developing their own Formula One engines. Red Bull already set up a factory for this purpose. Honda decided to provide support to the Red Bull racing team. Now, Red Bull is more than just a drink. They did something very daring and spent a lot of money, around $30 million, to send a person named Baumgartner to the edge of space and bring him back. They made a one minute, 41 second video about it on their YouTube channel and 47 million people watched it. That's a lot. After this, their sales went up by 7% in six months and they got a big 13% increase in sales all around the world. Such an outstanding move. It's really good at marketing, showing its skills in this area. The Space Jump global coverage was valued at around $6 billion, making the investment worthwhile. Sports serve as both a passion and a business for Red Bull. Red Bull maintains its market position through edgy sponsorships and products. In 2019, they sold 7.5 billion cans, earning $6 billion. Consider RB Leipzig, a German team. Red Bull bought a fifth level team in 2009, invested heavily, and reached the UEFA Champions League in 2019. RB Leipzig's value is 497 million euros, impressive as they don't produce even drinks. TC Pharmaceuticals makes original formulas. Other factories make flavors. Red Bull's investments in sports and media broaden value chains beyond cans. They combine media, team ownership, broadcasting, and contracts as seen in their football clubs. Owning multiple teams boosts benefits like talent growth. Their $25 million New York Bulls investment surged to $290 million. They still want to make sure that everyone knows about Red Bull in all parts of life even inside the company. Saravut Yuvidaya, a person from the company, said that when people start working at Red Bull, 95% of them don't drink Red Bull. But after some time, most of them started drinking it. Matashitz, the person who started Red Bull, didn't just want to make a good drink. He knew that it should be something more. That's why you can find Red Bull in 171 countries. That's almost everywhere. So what lessons can you apply from Red Bull's story to your own ventures? How can you infuse your passion into your projects and create a lasting impact? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you're hungry for more inspiring stories and business insights, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Thanks for watching.